Welcome back to the Bluegrass on this beautiful, and I mean beautiful, awesome, gorgeous fall day. We have some big time adventures planned, and uh, it's going to be real fun, make some good video. First, uh, my buddy Woodstock Mike is coming up from Nancy, and he's bringing his uh, side by side. And so we're going to load up and go down to Hollerwood ATV Park and take Tommy, the German Short Hair Pointer, and Lucy uh, on a nice little adventure, go to our favorite caveman spot. And uh, then we're going to come back up here. Mike's got to get back to to the house because his wife doesn't let him stay gone too long <laughs> and uh, then we're going to head over to the farm and we're going to take uh, my dog Mr. No Name and uh, do some real intense environmental socialization with Tommy on a farm where there's a lot of wildlife and stuff so all in all it ought to be a great day and uh, since we're taking Tommy out uh, and he's a German short hair pointer uh, I thought that this would be a great time to answer a question that I get uh, at least 20 times a week, which is uh, what do I think about German short hair pointers and uh, do German short hair pointers make good family dogs? Do they make good pets in the suburbs and the cities, things like that? So we're going to try to give you a quick overview of what I know or what I think about German short hairs and uh, then I'll just take you uh, on an adventure with us and you can kind of see what it's like to go out in the real world with one and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, that'll give you, that'll give the information that you need uh, so that you don't have to email me. <laughs> All right, we'll go up here to the Small Challenges course and get started. <laughs> All right, guys, well, <laughs> positioned behind that uh, Rhodesian ridge back there is Tommy, uh, the German short hair pointer that we're taking on an adventure today. Well, we're taking on two adventures today, so he's a really lucky dog. But uh, since he's going on adventures, I know for sure we're going to get a lot of emails. And I, like I said, I, you know, I get 20 emails a week. I probably get 100. Uh, I just don't read all the emails. They've got to kind of go through an Eli filter before they get to me. But generally speaking, whenever I feature these dogs, people email me and they say, Hey, Stoney, come on, tell me the truth. You know, just tell me. Now, I won't tell anybody else. You go ahead and tell me your real opinion about these dogs. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give everybody my real opinion. Uh, what do I think about them? Uh, well, number one, I mean, they're beautiful, right? You look at them and make sure want one uh, you're in a, you're in the bookstore and you're looking at garden and gun well obviously uh, you see that dog you see a good picture of it and you think man I need one of those those are those are awesome looking dogs uh, second thing they're super athletic they're really fun to hang around with really fun to take to the dog park because there's no dog gonna out athleticize these dogs you know they've got super high energy super high endurance great natural body awareness you'll see that when we go down to Hollerwood and let them climb over the hills and caves and stuff they're awesome with that they live forever right they live literally forever like 14 15 16 I've heard of them living 18 years okay they don't even really hardly ever get sick I mean like uh, I get them out here I, I, they're just awesome right as, 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 as far as general health goes and longevity I don't know of any medium to large size dog that's any better uh, they're awesome with children so I'll have one of my children walk him around and show you uh, and as a bonus to be honest with you they make a pretty decent natural guard dog okay and when I say a pretty decent natural guard dog what I mean is like you ain't gonna be training them to sick anybody I mean that's obviously you're not gonna be going and doing police dog work with them but if they're hanging out with your children and uh, somebody walks up from the side or the flank uh, or like the kids are in the backyard and somebody comes through the gate these guys will let them know and they're a good sized powerful dog and so uh, you know their messages rarely go unheeded now you might wonder because I normally do not uh, you know I normally don't have papers in my hands when uh, you know I'm talking about dogs but uh, let me show you you know why I have these papers this my friends is a great handout that you can get from the German short hair pointer Club of America right okay now uh, the neat thing about this handout is it's got all kinds of cool drawings you know so if you want to know something about uh, these dogs right okay like how they're supposed to be built uh, go get this handout and you'll notice on here <laughs> that I've highlighted a couple of things Here's why. Because German short hair pointer aficionados, listen, if you get something wrong when you're talking about them, they go nuts. They go crazy. Uh, you know, it's, it's the only thing worse than uh, talking about German short hairs and getting something wrong is uh, mentioning chalk, charcoal or silver labs. <laughs> that gets you thrown right under the bus. The whole Labrador Retriever Club of America would like to see me, uh, you know, hung up in a tree. <laughs> but listen, all I do is talk about what I do here, and I hope you guys enjoy it, okay? But I'm doing, I'm doing my best to do better, okay? So all you guys that love German short hairs, I'm trying really hard to do it right, okay? Hey, Charlotte, come get these papers. Okay. All right, so 
when we talk about these dogs being good dogs, you know, I mean, how do I judge a dog? It's, it's like the same thing with all the dogs, right? What do I need out of a family dog? I need them to come when they're called. I need them to be still when they're told. I need them to have good manners all the time, regardless of the environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, to be able to take them into, you know, different environments, I need to trust that the dogs, oh, have a, you know, kind of mastered a good basic vocabulary. What bo vocabulary do I use? Uh, come, like come to me. Let's go, like let's go for a walk and don't pull on the leash. Hup is a catch-all term we use for negotiating obstacles. Easy, hey, you know, don't knock into stuff. Wait, temporary pause, stay, stay there for a long time. Uh, now, so I'm going to illustrate that and then I'll hand this leash to George, uh, my 13-year-old son, and uh, we'll see if, uh, you know, Tommy does it as well for children as he does it for adults. Come on, Tommy. All right, so let's start off. I'll say, let's go, and then hop. Oh, uh, listen, guys, that is a hazard <laughs> of being a dog trainer and getting older at the same time, right? I have walked this course. There's 300 videos on my channel, and you've never seen me fall down like that, okay? So uh, I'm going to leave that in here. I'm slightly embarrassed, but, you know, for all you other old fellas out there trying to train your dogs, just accept it, you know, you're gonna fall down every once in a while. Let's go, Up. this is a little balance drill that you guys seen me do a million times, proprioception drill. Uh, he's doing this perfectly, even with these other dogs uh, roaming around. This is kind of a trust thing, little balance point drill. Pretty nice. Now, if you'll wonder why some of these other dogs are so aggravating, at my kennel, we kind of operate on a cycle. We get new dogs in that don't know much, uh, and they're wild and crazy and the job's really hard. And then, uh, like, uh, we get those guys lined out and we make some videos usually at about that point and they go home uh, and uh, then we get a new batch in. And right now we're kind of in between, uh, wait, we're kind of in between phases where we have a couple of dogs that are here and, you know, they're not far off going home, but we also have a bunch of dogs that just got here. So they're kind of running around, barking, generally getting into stuff, you know. Uh, but anyway, back to what we were talking about. You can see Tommy at 20, I don't know, maybe 22 weeks, 21, 23, something like that. Uh, he's pretty much mastered our basic vocabulary and our small challenges course. Uh, now, you know, I'm not saying all these words because I'm talking about other stuff, but you kind of get what's going on. You've seen it. Sit, stay. You know, what's that stay? You know, I kind of want him to be there for a long time. Now, with these short hairs... It's super important that you master your basic obedience in a relatively controlled environment because they are hunting dogs and when they go out, you can see them right now, there's some birds over there making noise and like he's, he's really being drawn towards those birds. And so for him to stay on that, uh, on that table, that's tough for him. And so you might see him reach down and pick up his leash with his mouth or stuff, something. That's what's called a displacement behavior. That's when a dog's in conflict and he's trying to do what's expected, but his natural desires and drives are, you know, kind of, you know, forcing him in the direction of, of doing other things. Okay, so uh, now we'll get uh, George to come over here and walk the dog. And uh, I'm going to read you a quote uh, from that handout. It's a cool quote that I think really encapsulates the spirit of this dog. Good boy. Okay, so here's George, my 13-year-old son, and he's going to walk Tommy around the Small Challenges course, work on his basic vocabulary. And while he's doing that, I want to read you guys a quote that I think is a very uh, awesome description of German short hair pointers in general. Here's a group of dogs that can follow wounded game or track deer and boar, work with the falcon, quarter ground close or wide, hold game on point, flush on command, mark and retrieve shot game, work in water and dense cover, withstand the cold and wet, and yet provide companionable loyalty and affection for their owners. I mean, hey, that's pretty good, no? Right? That, uh, this quote goes on to say, uh, you know, a good German short hair pointer, which knows its job is not simply part of the equipment, it's the most important member of the team. Now, that's a quote from uh, Hunter Pointer Retriever, the Continental Gun Dog. So, like, if you guys want to hear more of that kind of fancy talk, y'all should definitely check out that resource. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> personally, I can't talk or write near that well, you know. So that's why I had to read it off these papers. Uh, now, so, <clears throat> you see, George did a pretty good job. So, uh, you know... Do German short hair pointers mind well uh, for people? I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm 48 
and uh, dog minded for me. George 13, dog is minding for him. So all in all, we're usually pretty happy with them as it relates to how they mind. So you might say, well, Stoney, uh, if you're pretty happy with them about how they come out to the kennel and get along with the other dogs and how they mind and how they're healthy and stuff, uh, you know, what, are there any bad points? I mean, what should I, what should I think about? All right, so now I'm gonna walk him one more time and we can talk about uh, maybe the possible downsides to having a short hair. Okay, so now the, I would say that the, the biggest problem that we see uh, with people in short hairs is that people grossly underestimate the amount of exercise that it uh, takes to uh, you know, g keep these dogs' uh, energy level properly regulated, okay? More often than not, if, uh, if, if, if we get an email about somebody wanting to bring a short hair to us and they're having any type of destructive or rude behavior, uh, then it's because the dogs aren't getting quite enough exercise. And usually the reason they're not getting quite enough exercise is either they can't come and be still and have good manners reliably or uh, people's lives are just a little too busy, you know. So a lot of times people that like dogs that look like this, you see this dog, this dog's basically a fashion statement, you know. He's a beautiful dog. Well, a lot of times people that like beautiful dogs like this, they like beautiful clothes, beautiful cars, beautiful houses, all that stuff. Well, they got to work a whole lot to be able to afford that stuff. And so unfortunately, when they buy this dog, which what they're buying is the physical confirmation. They're buying the way the dog looks all too often. But when you buy short hair and the dog, and the dog looks like a short hair, in other words, it conforms to its uh, breed's physical uh, standard, you're also buying a dog that conforms to the breed's behavioral standard. And that's kind of what that quote was getting at, okay? The behavioral standard for this dog is a dog that is a versatile hunter, a dog that can point, can, uh, uh, <coughs> hunt and can retrieve game okay so if you live in the suburbs and uh, <laughs> you're not going out and providing an outlet for this dog's natural tendency to hunt point and retrieve then you got to figure out something to do with that energy now luckily these dogs are very forgiving and uh, they enjoy a wide range of activities you know uh, my personal preference is to get them to where they have good obedience and then take them to open spaces where, you know, they can kind of do what they're bred to do. Because I really like watching it, and uh, I hope you enjoy this video that we're going to make today. Because uh, we're going to try to really give you kind of an idea of what they look like when they're having fun. Now, when, they're, when we're doing that, probably, uh, so we're talking about energy regulation and stuff. Uh, the other thing that uh, like kind of goes along with that, but it's a real big problem with these short hairs and living in the suburbs, is that they dart off a lot, right? Okay, and so people will be like, hey, Stoney, my short hair's running away. Well, they're not running away like they're running away from, oh, what are you doing? Concentrate, dude. They're not running away like they're running away from home. What they're doing is they're running away from you in order to find game, right? And they don't care what the game is. It can be a butterfly or a rabbit or a bird, whatever. They'll hunt anything, okay? But when they dart away from you, they're going X amount of yards. And some of them will go two or 300 yards, some of them 100, some of them more, some of them less. But they all have a tendency to go away from you because like, for generations, these dogs have been bred based on their, you know, tendency to go out into a field with a handler. The handler's the hunter, and the dog roams and ranges until they find something. And then when they find something, they kind of lock up on it. The hunter comes up and used to a long time ago. Dogs, they would actually throw net before everybody had firearms. They would throw nets on birds. Believe they talking about a real sport, you know. Uh, but now everybody hunts with guns, and so the guy comes up and he kicks up the bird. The bird gets up and shoots it, and the dog goes and gets it. Right. So all of these dogs, for lots of generations, that's what they were bred to do. And just because you bought it and you live, you know, in a big house on a small lot, like that doesn't change the basic genetic character of uh, the dog. It's still a versatile hunting dog with a high energy level, high endurance level, and quick recharge rate. Okay, so that leads to going out and having dogs that are really hyped up and charged up. Whoa, wait a minute, dude. Sit. Uh, now, see, my dog has got up here, and my dog is kind of Tommy's hero. Uh, so Tommy's going to have a little bit of a hard time sitting and paying attention. Get, get back, Jealous. Uh, and this is what happens. Look, guys, even when you're training a dog and you've been, you know, y'all have watched me train this dog for a lot of months. Like, oh, when they hit puberty, get, they get jealous. They're crazy. They're just like kids. Oh, go on, dog. Don't need so much attention. All right. 
So we bring Tommy back over here. Sit. There, stay. Now, like see right there where I just ended up having to make Tommy kind of sit there and be still? Uh, well, he's kind of getting bored with his activity. And you see him starting to look around, the birds are catching his attention. That's what people run into. And that's why these dogs like seem to be hard-headed. He's not trying to be hard-headed right now. He's just interested in the stuff that the other dogs are doing. He pals around with Mr. No Name all the time. And we let him chase birds all the time. And so he's kind of like, hey, listen, Stoney, I'm having a hard time staying in this chair. Can't we wrap this up? So you have to understand that. You have to understand when you're in the suburbs, these dogs need their energy put into proper places, and they're still going to have a tendency to get distracted easily and to dart off. Now, why that's a big danger in the suburbs is because, like, when we go out later, you're going to see this dog ranging maybe 100 yards. We try to keep him in 60, really. But he's going to be ranging 60, 100, 200 yards in the suburbs. How many streets is that? How many soccer moms yelling at their kids in the back uh, is that, you know, going down the street? So, and this, you know, what can they do? They can get run over. They can cause a wreck. I mean, there's lots of trouble. But this right here, you saw Tommy do great for quite a bit of time. Then no name gets in the pool, and these dogs are playing, and these birds. Go, and this is what you get out of short hairs. A lot of times, this is how they get a reputation for being hard-headed. And Tommy's not being hard-headed right now. He's not being obstinate right now. He is doing his level best to stay there when he is bored completely out of his head. <laughs> and uh, that's just the way they are, okay? So th that's one of the things that we worry about. Now, the, uh, really, the only other things, uh, guys, is these dogs, they can be a little needy, you know, so you get them, and it's all these continental dogs. The, the, the short hairs, the wire hairs, the vizslas, uh, the Weimaraners, they're all kind of needy. I mean, you can't even go to the potty without them going with you. Uh, and so that neediness turns into anxiety. So you can get a little separation anxiety. They can be anxious with the vet, getting their nails done, things like that. Uh, and then the last thing, they're big jumpers. They love attention so much. Uh, and they have uh, so much athleticism and uh, range of motion in their joints naturally that uh, they, they just it, it just comes real natural to them to jump up on you. Okay, But that's about it, really. Okay, so that's about how Tommy minds at uh, however old he is, 21, 22, 23 weeks. Uh, and uh, you see, now he's happy. He's going over there, show what he's doing. See, No Name was it, like got in the pool for a second, so Tommy has went over there to see what No Name was after. <laughs> and this is how this works here, guys. You see them lab puppies? See, we, we, we use our mentor dogs uh, to encourage the, dog, the other puppies to follow along and do the kind of same activities. Now what we're going to be looking at, or, uh, which, which will be interesting for this video, is when we go down to Hollerwood, we're taking two puppies, okay? Lucy, who you're familiar with, and Tommy. And uh, we have to see how that plays out. What I normally like to do is I like to take one mentor dog and one young dog. So one dog that stays close and will come back as soon as you call it, and one dog that's just learning that. Sometimes if you have two that are just learning that at the same time, well, all bets are off. So hopefully we'll be able to go down there and it won't be too crowded. We can let the dogs out to play and uh, not have to put their long lines on them. But with this kind of dog, anytime you go out into a crowded environment uh, and you're not for sure, you know, able to get them back at the drop of a hat, you better put a long line on them because they can get out in the road super quick. All right, uh, that's all I got to say about short hairs in the short in, in, in this segment. Uh, now we'll just do some adventuring and you can make up your own mind as to whether you want to further investigate getting one for your house. All right. Well, now we are back at one of our favorite spots, and uh, we're going to go do some caveman-style exploration. And the last time that I uh, had you guys here, uh, this was kind of more grown up. And the reason that it's not grown up right now, we'll get up here and kind of show you what's going on. Uh, but go up this way, Eli, and uh, yeah, just come in between these trees and kind of show everybody what's going on down through here. Guys, people bring these fancy side-by-sides up here, uh, like Mike's, but way faster with way different kinds of suspension. And they race up and down these hills and stuff. And uh, super interesting, super steep, you know, so it's easy to, it's a lot easier to ride those side-by-sides up here than walk. That's why Mike, uh, <laughs> that's why Mike drove and we walked, all right? But what we like to do, we like to come over here and we got a whole little, we got a whole little path that we walk 
around this uh, big giant rock and escarpment. And what I like to say is I like pretending I'm a caveman and these dogs like pretending they're a wolf. Now the last time I was in here, I had a Morky with me. And of course Morky doesn't seem much like a wolf, but when you're watching this dog, watch him hunt. And uh, although he's not a wolf, he doesn't really look like a wolf exactly. If you watch his mannerisms, you can tell there's some wolf down in that German short hair somewhere, you know. And when you think about a versatile hunting dog, show him what he's doing there, Eli. Can't you just see a wolf climbed up on there like that, looking out across that uh, holler and, uh, you know, scouting for game, scouting for enemies, scouting for potential mates, you know. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's very wolf-like from my perspective. And what's a wolf? A wolf is a, the most versatile of all hunting dogs. <clears throat> They're awesome at hunting stuff and, you know, now maybe not retrieving it, but uh, even with retrieving it, I guess they do, right? Because they go out, they got to stalk something, they got to get real still, and then they pounce on it, kill it, and then eat it, and then go home and puke it up for their cubs. And it's pretty neat. You can watch that on like a National Geogra Geographic channel uh, or YouTube or whatever. So that's interesting. Come on. You watch these dogs. Now Lucy, she's walking around in here. She's pretending to be a little wolf too. If you watch the two of them, I'd say this guy is a little bit more wolf-like, you know? And then we come up through here. Oh, get to move on. Since they cleared all this brush out, this is really, really slippery. And that's why it's so important, guys, with young dogs to get them out, get them moving, let them engage in full range of motion activities. Because this right here, the balance, the, uh, 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 the environmental awareness that it requires for this dog to be in this position, it's a very precarious position. You bring a one-year-old dog, one year old dog out here and he's never got to exercise, he's never got to do any, you know, uh, like real life adventuring, he just fall down through there. Next thing you know, you're on your way to the emergency vet. That ain't no fun. So this whole idea of waiting till your dogs are older to get them out and get them moving and let them do interesting things, that's just a silly idea. It's mainly propagated by people that don't get out and do interesting things, you know? The next time anybody goes to giving you advice on whether or not you should take your dog and let them exercise, uh, it's generally those people are gonna fall into one or two categories. Like when you look at them and their answer is, hey, yes, you should take your dog out and, and, and expose it to a broad range of physical environments uh, that, are, that are demanding, both from a you know, physical standpoint and from a mental standpoint. Those people probably go out and do demanding activities. And the people that tell you, oh no, don't take them out, don't socialize them until they've got 900 vaccinations, and don't let them go up the steps, those people probably don't get out and do very many interesting things. And I, that seems to be the breakdown for me. Now, one of the things that you have to think about when you go out is you have to be environmentally aware yourself. And let me show you why. Come down here and show them this, Eli. Like, they've been uh, up here clearing brush. And uh, ideally, this stuff would all get cut down right at ground level, but it doesn't. And so these things, I've tripped on these a hundred times. Got to be aware of that. Sometimes the things are cut at angles. And so this is kind of sharp. And what happens is dogs, back up, Eli. Look at all these sharp ones. See how sharp these are? Okay, you know, when you get puppies out here, and these are briars right here, these are super sharp. When you get puppies out here, then they learn, because this is uncomfortable, they learn to be very aware, you know, and you'll learn to be very aware. The problem is, if you're watching my videos and you're an adult, dang, that window is almost closed on your ability to improve your own proprioception and environmental awareness. So you have to be extra, super duper careful. Uh, my own opinion is, uh, you should not do this activity. You just watch me and Eli do it. That's a safe way to engage in these uh, types of things. So I don't want any liability related to uh, <laughs> you slipping and falling. Now Tommy has, if you'll notice, Tommy's leading the way. He's already up that, uh, up that little path and ready to go around the back. And he likes to go around the back because there's more critters that live around the back. So I'll see if I can call him. Tommy, come on. Come on, buddy. Good boy. I was pretty lucky. Come on, come on. Now, this is another thing short hairs will do. You see how he kind of posted up there like he was just going to look at me and see what I was doing? Well, from his perspective, like he's supposed to be out finding stuff and then I'm supposed to come find him. That's Bird Dog 101. So I can't get too mad at him. Good boy. But wait till y'all see this. This is really fun and interesting. Oh. And uh, we're going to go through a 
awesome little like uh, cave area here. Come on, catch up, Eli. I done had to carry you through the creek. Don't make me carry you anymore. These young kids, guys, they can't hardly keep up with Uncle Stoney. All right, now this is where it gets cool because uh, usually time of day that we come on that side, sunshine, it's pretty hot, and on this side, it's pretty cool. So the dogs really like getting over here. We come down through here. Dang. How nice is this section, Eli? This is nice. This is super nice. This is a good spot to, if you were a little, <laughs> a young caveman, sneak off with your young cave lady, you know, come over here, look at, show them out through there, Eli. Show them how you want to get her a fancy cave and get her a, what, what do cavemen drive, Eli? What do they, you think they rode anything? Tigers? I don't know. <laughs> get her a fancy tiger that she could ride around like a queen and then talk her into making some little cave babies. All right, now you can, uh, this, this dog has spotted something because he keeps freezing up on me and then turning around and looking at me. So one of a couple of things can happen here. Uh, either we go ahead and we make this little track and he's pretty cool or <laughs> he runs off down that, uh, down that hill and I got to go chase him. Uh, either one of those things are liable to happen and you just kind of have to accept it, you know, I mean, what am I going to do? I've brought a dog out here. I don't have him on a leash. And so all we can focus on is kind of uh, getting a little better each time. And that means the incidence rate of failure will get less over the course of a certain amount of weeks. In other words, like I might have to go down there and get him three or four times today over the course of the day. And then the next time, maybe twice. And then the time after that, maybe once. And then maybe be a week. And I have to, you know, and you just so, so in other words, if you have a training day, like don't expect to go from like, the dog not minding like you want it to, to minding like you want it to. That's not how it works. It just, they say, over here it's not minding like you want it to. Over here it is minding like you want it to. You got to realize it's just a gradual set of steps. And it trends upwards, but there's plenty of bad days, plenty of bad sessions. And so don't sweat it too much. Eli's looking nervous like the dog has run off on me. So I'm going to see if I can get him back. Got a whistle. And usually, like I'll whistle for him. And then I'll kind of holler for them, and if that's not working, uh, you know, I'll kind of use that, uh, that big whistle for them. And usually when I use the big whistle for them, they come back pretty quick. He ain't got back here as quick as I wanted, so let's go over here and see if he has found something that he wants me to know about. Because that happens with these guys sometimes. I'm probably going to come over here and find him looking at something. Like, hey, Stoney, look what I got. Let's kill it. And... Uh, Hopefully that's what happened. What else could happen is he could have just decided uh, he was going <laughs> to Powell County or somewhere. Oh, very nice. Come on, come on. Oh, you're a smarty. You're a smarty. Oh, very smart dog. Oh, and right there, guys, listen. <laughs> it's hard when they're doing that to you, you know, not to get aggravated with them. But I'm out here in a, in a, you know, on the side of a hill in the middle of a big, you know, uh, wilderness area. What am I going to do, you know? If I get angry and I start calling him and I sound real mad, then he's really not going to come back to me, right? So uh, what I do is I just kind of, you know, I keep plugging away till I get him back. And then when I get him back, I love on him. And I tell him, you know, that's great. And we're going to take back off and we're going to go and we're going to go over to Sun Oil Lake and see what's going on over there. And then I just expect it to be a little better, you know, each time we come out. Uh, when I go home, you know, how I address it is I just go home and I go back to yard, my yard work. I work on my recalls. I work on my stop whistles and stuff. And, uh, you know, in between times, like we come out here and we judge our progress and then we go home and we work on what needs working on. And so with Tommy, you can see that uh, what needs working on is a little bit faster recall. <clears throat> but this is a super high distraction environment. Now, what would help me right now is if I had my dog with me, because if I had Mr. No Name with me, then like uh, he keeps these other dogs around a little bit better. Lu I, we've got Lucy with us right now, and uh, somehow or another we lost her. I think she went back there to hang out with Woodstock Mike. And so like right when I call, you know, I don't have, I don't have as much influence over the dog. So on our way back to the farm, we will stop. What are you looking at with that camera, Ela? On our, way, on our way back to the farm, we will stop and grab Mr. No Name 
and uh, you watch that his re this dog's recall will immediately uh, uh, get better you know all right now we're coming out behind that rock escarpment oh and uh, so Eli was asking me he's like hey dude you know what do people normally do when they haven't had much experience like that and I said they panic and uh, of course so you're out in an area like this with your dog and he gets a little ways away from you and you panic you start hollering at him you start acting mean or you start acting scared well all that does is makes it less likely that they're going to come back to you in a timely uh, manner you know really what you have to do is you just have to stick to your gun stay calm be firm fair and consistent you know and move yourself into a position where you can influence them that's why during the week you're constantly doing your yard work you're working on come and you're working on stop you know and you're working on the dog understanding the relationship between doing what they're told and getting access to what they want and that's what's going on here you know like if i have if i have a moment with tommy where he's not wanting to do something that's because what he thinks is that doing something for me is going to get in the way of doing what he wants and uh, it takes a while to build to, to to you know to build a you know to kind of build an understanding between you where the dog understands that the access to what they want comes all the way through you. I mean, he couldn't come down here by himself, you know? So I really want him to understand that, uh, hey, I'm not trying to give him a hard time, you know? I'm trying to make sure that he gets to go, oh, more and more places. Tommy's owner is actually probably not gonna be tromping around out in this kind of area, uh, but he is a pole vaulting coach. And he's got a big van, and he carries pole vaulters around, and goes to pole vaulting condition, or competitions and stuff. And so we need to know that we can trust Tommy to be out. And uh, so this is one kind of environment that we put him in. Uh, Ray's going to be in a different kind of environment. But the, you know, the, the, the basic rules are going to be the same. You know, the, the dog needs to be able to stay focused and stay compliant regardless of the distraction level. You know, me and Eli just like uh, hanging out out here. Show them, Eli. A little more than we like hanging out uh, at pole vaulting competitions. <laughs> What about you, Woodstock Mike? You want to go to a pole vaulting competition? No. <laughs> no. All right. Well, let's get in this Terex and get back to traveling. Hey, going out there, Mike. We'll see. Hey, you gotta be careful because this is not uh, no. This is not an OSHA compliant. Uh, a bridge here. Uh, there's a bunch of places up here where it uh, it uh, has <laughs> got holes in it. Just to be frankly honest. Oh, here comes Lucy, and there goes Tommy. Dang, nice. Mike, you're uh, like a Pied Piper of dogs. I thought dogs liked me. They follow you around better than me. I had that Morky out here. And his little feet kept <laughs> falling in the hole. His feet kept falling through those holes. <laughs> My wife was tripping out the whole time. Look how pretty this place is. Ain't this a good place to come adventure? Oh, it is. It's Beautiful. super nice. Super nice. I bet there's a fish or two in there, too. Uh, there are definitely some fish in there because uh, me and Eli was trying to spear them last time we were here. We did not have much in the way of success. You ever speared any fish, Mike? I've shot them with a bow. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody can shoot a fish with a bow. Yeah. You got to spear them. Look at that mountain. Dang, what a beautiful mountain. All right, guys. Close up my truck. Get my last drink of coffee. And we will be on our way. So, we have my dog, Mr. No Name, and uh, Tommy, the German Short Hair Pointer. We're just going to take a little walk. Let them roam around and, uh, you know, do cool stuff. This is just kind of a, one of our normal little puppy-sized adventures. Probably at some point, uh, we'll come back over here by the pond, throw the dummy off in the pond a little bit. It's a little bit chilly today. It was down to about 37 last night. I think it's up to 50-something right now. Uh, so Tommy might or might not want to get in the water. Now, of course, you know, my dog, uh, there won't be any keeping him out of the water. But we're just going to walk around, let these dogs explore a little bit. Now, as I'm walking around, uh, what I need to try to establish with Tommy so he doesn't get too far away is I need to work on calling him back every so often, you know. Good boy, Tommy. Very nice. Good. So I tell him I appreciate coming back, and then I let him go do his own thing. 
And really the kind of point that I'm making to the dog is if they'll work with me, then I'll give them a lot of freedom. You know, I need for them to be reliable as it relates to coming back and being still when I tell them and having good manners. But uh, if they'll do that, I do my best to make sure that I pay them with a lot of freedom and a lot of adventure. So there they go, they take off, getting a little too far. So then I call them back. Come on, Tommy, good boy. Very nice. Now you'll notice this guy here, he always comes back pretty quick and I don't have to worry about him going too far. Tommy, he can be a little rangy. You know, sometimes he'll get out 100 yards, 150 yards and, and where we are, uh, it's okay because I'm on a big farm, uh, but I gotta be careful about that. So I'm trying to kind of range him back in a little bit so that maybe he only goes 40 or 50 yards. Tommy, come on. Now it can be harder guys, cause like right there you say, you know, Tommy's found something and uh, he's smelling it. And so he's like, wait a minute, you know, why do I have to come back, Stoney? And if I've done my yard work right at the kennel, then he comes back because he realizes that if he doesn't come back, then he's not gonna get to keep doing what he wants to do. Good dog. Now, as we come up through here, like uh, you'll notice, Tommy, uh, he'll he'll be in and out of all this uh, all these uh, this tree line here, and he'll probably catch run he'll probably run up on something here in a second that he wants to get, and that's where the real testing of your ability to call your dog comes into play. You know, can you stop them? You know, can you make them stop, look, and listen? And then can you get them to come back? And uh, you have to be real patient about that, and you have to put to, you know put in your your work at your at your house if you want to be successful when you go out. When I mean, the first few times you do this, you definitely want to let the dog, you know, maybe use a trailing line or something so that you can get a hold of him if you need to. We're pretty we're pretty sure Tommy's not going too far. He comes back in. I tell him I appreciate it. Now it's kind of important to realize that, like when I you know when I he comes back in, you'll see me reach down and give him a little treat or, or pet him a little bit. He's not coming back just for that treat, okay? He's coming back because we kind of have a, you know, a pattern developed between us where his continued access to what he wants is dependent upon meeting my expectations. And then the treats are just kind of a physical manifestation of uh, my approval in his uh, overall performance. So that's why I like treat work doesn't always work for you guys because you, you know, sometimes you're presenting it like, hey, I'll give you a treat if you don't chase that squirrel. And the dog's like, squirrel, treat. Oh, okay, no. We don't give them those exact kind of options. What we do is we do a whole lot of volume training. And so over the course of the day, we're constantly tying the dog's access to getting anything that it wants. You know, free time, play with the other dogs, it's fetching items, it's chewing items. We tie all that into coming and being still and having good manners. So you'll notice there, I changed whistles, right? I carry two whistles. One of them is for when I'm just talking and one of them is for when I need to raise my voice. It got a little bit windy and these dogs got a little bit far away from me. So I had to bring the second whistle into play. It's a little, it's a little bit louder. It's a little bit more forceful, you know? <clears throat> now you'll see there guys, I'm using my kind of my low volume whistle. And as much as possible, I like to use a soft tone of voice. Now, I mean, I have the proper vocal inflection, I have the proper posture, but I try not to be too loud with the dogs, try not to sound too forceful. And uh, kind of my thinking is this, right? If I have to be loud to get the dog to do normal stuff, then what am I gonna do the day that I have an emergency, you know? So I always try to put the emphasis on the dog's side, right? So I'm gonna speak relatively quietly you know, uh, most of the time. And if the dog wants to hear me, he's gonna have to try to listen better. And then when the dog gets used to listening, when I'm speaking softly, if I do have to raise my voice or be a little bit more forceful, then it's a little bit shocking to the dog. And you know, it makes a, it makes a whole lot of uh, difference in terms of the impression that that vocal inflection makes. Now you'll remember not long ago, we were over here in a soybean field and this was all green. You know, and it might have been hard. I, you know, I tried to tell you about soybeans, but it might have been hard for you to really understand just how many soybeans are on a plant. But look at all these bean pods. 
guys this is what uh you know this is the 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 pinnacle of thousands of years of selectively breeding plants uh for agricultural production you know look at all those look at that isn't that crazy look at all those seed pods dang that's super nice Go over here and let's see what Tommy's doing, Eli. He's just kind of hunting around in there. I don't know if you guys can see him or not. One of the things, Tommy, what you doing, buddy? One of the things when you have these kind of dogs is when you first start taking them out, I mean, it can be a little bit nerve wracking because, well, okay, it's not nerve wracking to people that, that actually know about these dogs and have raised these dogs and hunt with them and stuff. But a lot of people that are getting these dogs now, they get them because they like their personality. Uh, they like the way they look, of course. And these dogs are incredibly healthy. They live 15, 16 years old and they generally don't have any, you know, big health issues, you know, knock on wood. Uh, so, like, I know that you guys out there that raise short hairs, y'all are perfectly familiar with what it's like to take them out. Uh, for normal people that get a dog based on looks, you know, and maybe aren't super familiar with the behavioral confirmation, then coming out here like in a field, it's a very daunting experience because the dog keeps moving away from you. Okay, but just always remember that what you've bought is a bird dog like and they don't breed bird dogs to go out into a field with you and stand there and look at you and go, hey, I wonder if there's any birds over there. No, the dog's whole point of existence is to run off finding birds. Back up there, Eli, maybe you'll be able to see what they're doing right now. But in this tree line here, there's a ton of birds. Okay, back up so you can see this tree line, Eli. There's a ton of birds, and that's why, <laughs> that's why these knuckleheads keep running in and out of this tree line here. And so it's pretty easy for, my, for me to position myself in a way that, <clears throat> you know, keeps Tommy safe. Uh, I don't have to worry about no name being safe because he ain't going anywhere. But with Tommy and these short hairs in general, as long as you think, you know, about where you're taking them and you understand that they're liable to dart off and go a little ways, you know, then it's okay, you know, there's no reason to, no reason to trip out. Come on, Oaks. Just take the appropriate precautions. Either run them in a field big enough for you know them not to get lost, or you know uh, put them on a long line and keep them a little closer than what they would like to be. And that uh, they they don't love that. I'm not gonna lie, you know. Uh, but you can kind of gradually give them a little bit more freedom as you trust them more. Now watch, these dogs are probably going to get uh, pretty excited as they get over here next to that pond because there's lots of stuff that lives over there next to that pond. And you see how that short hair is always on the hunt, you know, always looking to get something. Now in the summertime, whenever the dogs get close to that pond, <laughs> whenever the dog get close to that pond, frogs go everywhere. I mean, there's thousands of frogs that live in this pond <laughs> and uh, uh, now it's pretty cold so I guess the frogs have all holed up you know what happened right there was <laughs> that uh, Tommy he didn't realize that that green stuff just sat on top of the water and so he went out there trying to <laughs> jump on that he, th he thought that maybe somebody had rolled out a nice carpet for him or something <laughs> he jumped off in there and went straight into the mud he was like oh no what's happening now, No Name's familiar with this pond, so he's out in there all the time. And yes, I realize there's some algae out there, but don't be, uh, don't be giving me a hard time about the blue-green algae killing my dogs. We hadn't lost one yet. Just walk over here in this cornfield a little bit. Here, dogs! We can get them to come with us. <coughs> come on, come on. Now, one of the important parts about getting out into you know different environments, uh, and and make making sure that you actually get out in the environment also is you want to understand the terrain yourself, you know, and you want your dog to understand different types of terrain. Like if we just practiced over there in the field or by the pond, the ground is uh, nice and level, you know. We come over here and there's a lot of undulations, there's a lot of holes, there's a lot, a lot of rocks out here in this uh, in this high grass and stuff. And so the dogs have to, you know, they have to get some experience, you know, learning how to read the terrain and learning how to take a safe route. You know, a lot of times people give a, you know, they, 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 they work in their yard, they work at the park, 
Maybe they've even got them a training field that they'll go to. And then they get out in a, in a real life situation like this and uh, the environment is overwhelming for the pup. Or just to be honest with you, sometimes the environment's overwhelming for the owner. Ain't that right, Eli? Oh yeah. Hey, we bring people over here all the time and we have to leave them up there on the road because as they come down through here, they're stepping and falling and carrying on. I'm afraid they're gonna sue me, you know? So we come, we come over here for the environmental socialization aspect and uh, you know, not just that, but to build work ethic. Like you'll notice I'm just kind of playing fun dummies with, uh, with uh, no name and letting Tommy kind of follow along. But this is really hard work, guys. And so when I throw this dummy, you know, over there in the grass, like they've got to go over there and hunt and sniff and smell and, and deal with the briars and, and it takes a lot of work. You know, it's not easy work. If you think it's easy work, you should go over there and try to find that with your face. You know, it's tough. And uh, so we just you kind of come over here and we make it a little harder every time we do it. Very nice. So you'll kind of notice that uh, I'm not doing much in the way of obedience uh, with my dog. I'm just kind of letting him serve as a mentor for Tommy. To come over here, let Tommy get the idea that it's cool to jump around in the bushes and look for stuff. And then uh, start throwing the dummy so Tommy starts going, wait a minute, I'd like to get a chance to do that. So then I can bring my dog back here and hopefully make him sit and stay. And I'm going to toss this dummy for Tommy. Now I can't toss it as far. You know, and I'm not asking any obedience out of Tommy because this is his first time over here in you know, this particular field. So we're going to toss it easy and uh, hopefully he'll go get it. And if he doesn't, you know, I'll send my dog. So I throw it over there in the brush. Let him go see if he'll get it. Now, you know, he's liable to take it and go up there into the shade or go off over here. He's been doing okay with fetching at the kennel. I don't know exactly what to expect. Uh, so I'm not going to hold him to a super high standard. Hey, oh, stay. And look, he brought it pretty much all the way back. And uh, he was probably going to bring it all the way to me. And, he's in, and my knucklehead got up a little bit and intimidated him. And he's like, well, uh, I'll just drop it out here. So you stay there. And we'll throw another one for Tommy. I'm going to throw it right over in, uh, kind of in the middle of those uh, bushes over there, Eli. So I just made it hard for him. I threw it right in the middle of a bunch of bushes. And he went right in there and got it. Okay, so why don't you do this, Eli? Go over that way a little ways, or that way. I guess over that way since the sun. And uh, I'll see if I can get a get a bit, little better throw. Stay. Okay, Eli, can you see over there in uh, kind of that little pink flowery patch? I can. Alrighty, so we're going to toss for Tommy again, right over in the middle of those bushes. And look, he went right over there and got to hunting. Dang. Goes over there. Come on, Tommy. Now they might get a little distracted here. Don't worry about it. Good. And I uh, didn't bring it all the way back to my hand, but that's pretty good for out here. Remember, I'm always telling you, you know, that your expectations kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're operating on a sliding scale. And uh, what you want is to go out into different environments and uh, set appropriate goals and then make, uh, you know, just incremental progress towards reaching those goals. So I'm perfectly happy with Tommy hunting hard right here and bringing it back pretty close to me. And this week at the kennel, I'll try to firm that up a little bit. So I'm gonna throw it back over there in those bushes. Give him a little bit of time to get it. Good boy, Tommy. Very nice. Very nice. Good. And he brought it close enough back to me so that I could pick it up just by bending over, which is not my favorite, but, uh, you know, it's pretty good. I'll take that. One of the things, you know, I get a lot of emails about this, about, you know, important stuff as it relates to training. But ultimately, guys, you know, the important stuff is what's, what I'm doing right now. It's just getting out here and, uh, you know, letting these guys live and learn. Uh, there's nothing like real life experience to teach a dog what they need to do. Now, do you need to cover some basics before you go out? Uh, sure. You know, you need to have a pretty good idea that dog's going to come when you call it. You need to have a pretty good idea that dog's going to stop when you tell it. And of course, if you're going to go out and be around other people or other people's property, then uh, you for sure, you know, have to have a dog that has good manners. Um, but we do pretty good at the kennel, you know, kind of getting that baseline established. And so it makes coming out here and going on these real life adventures uh, you know, pretty easy and pretty fun. And, uh, you know, I'd say that that's just coming out here and adventuring is uh, that's a big part of our, you know, whole success or, you know, our whole uh, 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 kind of our whole paradigm as it relates to, you know, encouraging dogs to be self-regulators. 
We're really big on helping dogs learn to, you know, make good decisions on their own, just like children, you know, children, employees. I don't, you know, I don't get up in the morning, you know, and want to go boss people or dogs. You know, I want to help them make good decisions that work out well for themselves and me too, you know. Show them there, Eli. Put down in the comments below if you know what that is. Now we keep walking. Ah, uh, now you know Tommy. You see, he kind of, he kind of, he kind of got his fill of running a little bit and smelling. And now I've been able to, to, to bring myself over here and get close to him, and talk to him. And be like, hey Tommy, what'd you find, buddy? You know, and he's like, follow me. I find some more of the same thing. We'll probably jump those deer up. I hope Eli can get that on the footage. I don't know if he'll be able to or not, but hopefully he will. You can see these deer, because they don't go far. Most of the time, like if you jump them up, they kind of just go over here to their next uh, safe spot. They're used to people. And there's a lot of people that come over here and work, you know, so they don't get too spooked. <clears throat> come on, come on. See if I can get him moving this direction. Maybe we can find those deer again. Good dogs. Ah. And look at him out there just having a good time. So for all you people, you know, that have short hairs that are giving you, you know, giving you a hard time during the week, man, if you can carve out just a little bit of time on the weekend to take them, go out, to take them out and let them be kind of what they are, guys, they love this, you know. And you don't have to be a hunter, right? You, you don't have to go out and, and kill anything, but you can still let them go out and hunt and, and you can enjoy the process. You get to, you, get, you just get to experience the great outdoors and that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do on my channel is we're trying to get out, get moving, do interesting things and, you know, trying to appreciate the dogs for what they are. We're not trying to, like, if you think in terms of, you know, making dogs mind, like Tommy, the expectations that we have for him are different than the expectations that we have for No Name. Uh, and uh, that's because they're different, you know, they're different kind of dogs. Uh, you know, so like, like, like this, let's say that this is a round peg, well it needs a round hole. And then Tommy, he's a square peg, so he needs a square hole. So we got to come out here and let him be a square peg. And this is what they love, to, they just love to do it. I, you know, I have a lot of these dogs on my channel. And if, if you go back and you watch those videos, like this is all they do, isn't it, Eli? All day. I mean, listen, we just come over here and uh, they just hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt. And uh, then they get in the truck and they're calm and quiet for the whole rest of the day. Now, if we don't bring them over here, if we don't take them out back at my place, then they're into everything. They jump up a lot, they get on the counters, they do all that kind of stuff, you know, just because they got a lot of energy and they need a place to put it. See here, we're kind of working on, uh, like we can gradually shape this activity here where, see how I kind of kept him over here close to me with those whistles? Um, and I, I gradually get it to where, like he just, when I tell him to, uh, he'll just gravitate over here to this general area and stay with me, which keeps him safe when you're hunting, you know, or just keeps him safe when you're walking in town. So I try make him walk a few paces here and give him as a little reward there. He's gonna go away, watch. Kind of wait for him to get back around here, sweep him into this motion, tease him a little bit, get a few extra steps. So appreciate it. Now he can kind of go on. And I'm not forcing him to walk over here right now. I'm just kind of giving him the opportunity to play that game with me. You see? Kind of comes over. I'm going to make him take just a few more steps here than last time. Give him his reward. <laughs> My dog's like, hey, wait a minute, dude. I'm the one that usually gets to play this game. And here comes Tommy. Past Eli. There we go. Make him walk just a few more steps. And this is just a fun game for him, guys. You know, if you play it right, then they look at coming back as not something that you're forcing them to do, but something that they get to do. And then he'll head off a little ways, and I'll call him back. And <laughs> Nice. Nice, good. And we just kind of, you know, we just kind of build on this stuff a little bit at a time. And the next thing you know, you can come over here 
and you can kind of tell them that it's okay to go off and hunt and carry on. Uh, but then if like uh, people are coming by, there's you know tractors or whatever, combines, whatever, you can tell them to get back over here close to you and they'll kind of get back over here, not in a real, you know, not in a real formal heel position, but just kind of over here in this area. And uh, that makes you not have to put them on the leash. You see how that's working? Very nice. Goes to going away. And see, I don't, you know, I, I don't just like uh, make it easy, you know, but I don't always make it super hard either. Comes back, tease him, make him walk a little farther, give him one, maybe a little farther, give him two, maybe a little farther, give him three, good. And this, listen, this is not super fast, this, this thing that I'm doing here, uh, but if you do it for a few minutes every night on your, you know, your, your walk, by the time a dog's seven, eight, nine months old, uh, like you can just kind of whistle for them and they'll pretty much fall over into this area and be good. And you can see that on those inductive retrieve videos that I do too. Like I just, you know, I call the dogs to me and then I kind of brush them over here into this general area. And then over time, I take a, you know, something that's very general, uh, like getting in this general area and I turn it into something very specific, like, uh, you know, flip into the heel position and, and uh, hold your retrieving item until I ask you to release. Or, you know, like a formal heel where the dog has to walk with his head right by your knee. Uh, although I honestly never ever really run into a situation where I need a dog to walk with his head right by my knee. He brush him over here into this side a little bit. Tease him, tease him, tease him. Very nice. And reward. Now we're back at the pond. And uh, I'm over here and just see what happens. Uh, just get over here to where we can kind of see what's going on. Now go over there and look. Um, you can already see that uh, my dog is in the pond and Tommy is on the bank. And Tommy's looking at No Name like, well, what are you doing, dude? And No Name's looking at Tommy like, well, what are you doing? Of course, we're getting in the pond. You know, now normally what I do when the weather's a little bit nicer is I just take my shoes off and I get right in this mud. I'm not going to do that today, though, because I'm wearing boots and... Uh, like when I'm wearing boots, I got to unlace them, take off my socks, just a big mess. So I'm just going to kind of throw some fun dummies for this dog here. And hopefully Tommy will decide he wants to chase him out there in the pond. Look. <laughs> what do you think, dude? You're supposed to go out there. <laughs> go on out there. Now, it, you, you see Tommy is running into the same thing those other dogs run into when we bring him over to the pond. He comes over here and he's, he's thinking about this being ground. You know, it's been pretty dry this August. He, he doesn't really have much in the way of experience with mud. Even my creek where we take him exploring, it's pretty dry. And so, like, you watch him with his feet. He's like, hey, I don't know what this is. And, like earlier at the pond where he went out there and he jumped on that... Uh, <laughs> he jumped on that uh, algae thinking it, that it was solid and he fell through. Come on. Go on, dude. You can do it. There he goes. Maybe. Oh, good dog. Come on, come on. Oh, very nice. Come on, Tommy. Look at there. We tease Tommy a little bit, let him know what we're doing. Just go get it. <laughs> oh, almost. He's thinking about it. Hey, you can really tell the difference when I get in out there versus when I don't get out there, can't you, Eli? Yeah, be a little bit more patient as the weather gets cold. I used to be quite a bit tougher as it related to getting muddy and wet when it's cold, and I guess I'm getting soft in my old age. Oh, come on. All right, now these dogs are wet and muddy, and uh, so a simple trick to kind of knocking some of that mud off of them is just to play fetch with them over in the high grass 
and uh, they'll go kind of waller around in there and as they're wallering around in there then uh, the grass is kind of getting all the mud off of them and you know they're they're moving around so the water naturally will kind of move off their coat uh, and of course labs are you know they got perfect coats for shedding water but short hairs are you know they're pretty good they're kind of oily and uh, that that uh, water uh, they shed water pretty quickly so I tried to throw the dummy right off in the middle of that tall grass uh, so that they would have to spend quite a bit of time in there very nice oh my gosh right, so we're gonna nice. do that one more time we're gonna throw oh into the high grass let them move around in there and uh, get as much of that mud and water off as possible <laughs> now what happens <laughs> about as often as not is uh, they'll go over there and they'll kind of you know get some of that mud off of them and then on the way back to the truck they'll run and jump in the pond again <laughs> so it's like six of one half a dozen of the other oh my gosh very nice dog and uh tommy's still over there hunting so we got to tell him it's time to go back to the kennel come on tommy oh and look at here guys this is the one thing you know y'all might not like if you live in the suburbs you might not be familiar with that remember i made a video like a few videos back about golden doodles being hypoallergenic but really they just go out in the world and uh, bring all the allergens and all the crazy stuff back into the house oh well that my friends is a cucklebur and uh, we bring those golden doodles and other coated dogs over here every so often and uh, they'll get a hundred of these in, in, in their coat and it literally it's, it's a two-hour nightmare getting them cleaned up that's why we like these guys y'all want one more time okay we've had a great session so far Tommy's got in a lot of environmental socialization got in some retrieving got in a whole lot of hunting from his perspective didn't run off chasing a deer that was awesome we had one little setback uh, you know I threw my dummy off into the pond knowing my dog would go get it and Tommy's such a strong natural retriever I kind of figured he would head on out there at least after we did a couple of repetitions and, and at least get chest deep in the water and he didn't and I didn't really wear the appropriate footwear for getting in the for getting in the pond today I've got a lady coming from up in Ohio somewhere so I can't get too awful muddy and dirty uh, so I just figured we'd end this session uh, we'll do a little bit of acclimation work get the get Tommy used to he's over there with Eli get him used to you know hearing gunfire and uh, go ahead and work on my dog kind of being steady the fall now we're down a man normally my son is the one with the dummy launcher and he's positioned up there somewhere up at a little station and uh, that way uh, you know when uh, he uses the dummy launcher dogs looking out and up uh, if you use the dummy launcher yourself and your dog's like right here sometimes the dog will just kind of start looking at you or looking at the dummy and that's that's not ideal I mean it's not bad you know it's not ideal so I'm gonna kind of make a little uh, adjustment to that I'm gonna bring my dog over here I'm gonna ask him to sit here uh, and tell him to stay there hopefully and then I'm gonna just position myself up here that way I can launch the dummy uh, and if my dog breaks, uh, hopefully I'm in front of him so I can influence him and get him to sit back down. Now, if everything goes good, he'll wait for me to tell him to go get it. No. Sit. And it didn't go perfect, right? And that's going to happen to you, so don't get upset. That's, it's going to happen a lot. And if you get upset, it's just going to mess up your training session. If your dog was perfect at that, then you wouldn't be training anymore, right? Okay, so when that happens, just uh, address it and uh, get back to doing what he's supposed to do. And then his reward for doing what he's supposed to do is getting to go get the thing that he wants. Go get it. And it took him a little while, but uh, look, he came out with it, so that's okay. I'm going to ask him to sweep himself around. Come on, heel. get around into this heel position and uh, sit there. Okay, very uh, nice. Try that one more time. You sit there. Stay for me. I'm going to come up here and shoot my dummy. No name. Release the dog. Hopefully he'll go right to it and find it and bring it back to me. 
at this stage guys sometimes like uh they'll look you know they'll kind of get it in their mind that it's someplace and they'll run to there i'd like to try to resist the urge to help them too much i want them to kind of go over there and and hunt it up on their own and i want them to get good at at like remembering where it fell oh good dog very nice and if you're patient and persistent and consistent <laughs> normally what will happen is something about like this here uh and like i said he's about 10 months old tommy how old is tommy you like six months old Six months, 22 weeks, something like that. Uh, but anyway, guys, that's what, uh, that's what a session with a short hair in a lab looks like when you're primarily focused on doing environmental socialization and kind of exposing them to the things that you like for them to do in the future. That wasn't bad.